second, it's looking for those boxes to be checked. So even though that was all in the description, he was showing these dealers, look, I search for a sunroof on your website. It's not here. Well, it's in my comments. Well, I know, but somebody narrows the search down. It's not there. Don't wait around for the up bus. Get in the driver's seat and take control of your operations. Are you ready to increase profitability, have better processes, and get proactive with your operations? Welcome to the Up Boss Podcast. Here's your hosts, Jason Harris and Jason Rice. Hey, 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 what's going on? Podcast Nation is Jason Harris here along with Jason Rice. That's right, the two Jasons. And we are here on the Up Boss Podcast. Dude, I'm, t I'm telling you, I know I said this before. But this is like one of the highlights of my week, right? To be able to sit down, jam with you about everything and anything we all actually want to jam about. How's your week been going, Jason? What's up with you? Uh, it's been good. Coming good. So it's been an extended weekend at the Lake of the Ozarks. Oh, yeah. Something degrees here. So at this point in time, it is. Trying to, squeeze in, trying to squeeze in the last bit of summer as much as possible. Yes, we are. <laughs> I'm actually excited this week, man. I actually, my house is finally, the remodeling is finally done. And I'm actually moving in only been like nine months so it's like this is a big this is a big week for us so i'm i'm excited and, and speaking of big weeks we have a big topic today today we are um we're going to the spa that's that's what we're doing we're, we're going to the spa we're gonna we're gonna go get little uh rejuvenation maybe a little revitalization all right we're gonna we're gonna put cucumber slices on our eyes and we're gonna lean back to a mud bath no we're not we're not we're yeah not. i think but, you lost a lot of people on that one I think I did. I think everyone just like tuned off real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Today we're talking about revitalizing age used car inventory strategies for turn over, for turning slow moving units into profitable sales. This is going to be a really fun topic, man. And I'm super excited to do this one with you uh, because this, this is my jam. I like this stuff, you know, and, and this, this first one we got the art rejuvenation. <laughs> Sorry. I keep thinking the spa thing, man. I can't get it out of my head. Um, <laughs> you know, like reconditioning aged inventory is an art. I, 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 it just is. I think reconditioning inventory in general is an art. And, um, you know, I've, I've recently been on a lot of lots lately, used car lots, uh, cause yeah. I was out doing some, some dealer visits with some friends of mine. Okay. And I gotta be honest with you. I feel like that art form has kind of been lost. I mean, I don't know, maybe it's because the last few years, if you had it on your lot and there was a price tag on it, you could sell it. You know, um, yep. and it's now it's like kind of getting back to it's like, you know, now there's more inventory, more options, but love to get your thoughts and ideas on uh, how we can recondition better or better strategies for reconditioning to enhance the value. Now, are you talking recondition an age car or a fresh car to enhance the value? Well, I, I think I because, I, you know, at some point in time, you're right. It almost has to go through a second day at the spa, right? You know, you get yeah. that first day because how many times have we gone on a lot and you look at your aging inventory, you know, you can already see, you know, stuff starting to build up on it. Um, you know, it's, it was sitting underneath the tree. It's got sap pieces all over yeah. it. <laughs> well, so, I mean here, yeah, sometimes you got to take that age car and replenish it, redetail re it. Maybe the battery's dead eventually it's sitting there or we pass on something that maybe we shouldn't. But there's small things that I think that you could do too to enhance the value of the car um, examples, you know, we, we were a couple, couple dealerships I was on and we had it on an F-150. We had it on Jeep Renegade. A guy just did it on a, a Subaru is and all the three of these were black cars mm -hmm. and the back three windows weren't tinted. You know, they're just plain glass windows. So an F-150, I'm like, man, tint those back three. It'd make this truck so much better. It was a Subaru Outback. Same thing as a black Subaru Outback. As a matter of fact, I think I had hubcaps, but the, all the windows were clear. It's like, all right, go tent those back three or something, get this thing standing a little bit taller. So, and usually like a tent doesn't cost that much more money to do mm -hmm. it. Um, or there was a truck, there's a Rangers is a base truck sitting there and he's priced competitively, but he still had a few grand left on it. And I'm like, man, why don't you, what it cost to throw a couple, maybe some tires or wheels or both on that thing, and maybe spruce it up a bit. Um, so, you know, obviously, reconditioning and what you spend there sometimes is tough because customers don't see all the stuff you did to it without you having to explain it. And then everybody else says they do 120 point inspection and everything else, but the stuff that could stand out, like I said, the, the, 
little bit extras here, you know, throw that bed liner in that truck that's all scratched up. What does it cost you a few hundred bucks as you, at your cost? You don't have to put a spray in and just pop a pop a, a bed liner in there um, and tent the back three, and it's a totally different truck. The other hints, a little do, and there's some of the other hints, um, and a lot of dealers do this, some don't. I've seen enough that I would assume more don't do it than do. Uh, the back hitch on those trucks, you know, and that yeah. and it's all rusted. I'm like, what's it take? The piece of a little bit of piece of, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a cardboard to block the bumper and to spray a little bit of black spray paint on that bumper so it don't look all rusted out and scratched up bed. You know, sp- take spray and then throw a plastic bed liner in there and it's a different truck, you know. It is little things like that that you could be doing to help those cars move quicker. But it, but it, but it is those little things. I mean, I remember a lot of times those little things, you know, just like um, I used to have one guy at my shop, uh, amazing detailer. Um, and I could tell you, he could take the ugliest set of headlights and just make them look brand new, you mm-hmm. know. And it, but but yeah, I mean, nobody wants to buy a car with a faded set of headlights on it, yeah. you know. So it's, it, I find I find sometimes sometimes cars will sit there and age, but it's the little things that are actually making it age. Oh, you know, yeah. It's like if we didn't just spend the extra 40 minutes to polish out those headlights and make them look nice and fresh, yeah, yeah. you know, if we didn't spend, you know, um, another 20 bucks to replace that cracked, you know, um, um, hub right on the wheel, you know, the, the, the cover, the cover, the wheel cover, right? Like yeah. little things like this, I feel like sometimes can actually impact just the fact that they're aging. I mean, I love accessories. I'm in love with accessories. In fact, I mean, that's a like, for for me as a salesperson, and even when I owned my own dealership, you know, that's I mean, I made a lot of money on accessories. I mean, as a salesperson from a commission perspective, I sometimes make more money just on the accessories of the car than the car itself. Yeah. You know, and I did. I had this amazing used car manager that loved accessories as well. And I probably learned a lot from him. And, you know, I, he had that F-150, you know, XL, you know, sitting on there with the extended cab. You know, if you go on Auto Trader, there's like 5,000 of them, you know, but hey, he throw the little leveling kit on it, you know, a little two and a half inch leveling kit on it, slap a little mm-hmm. bit, some more tires on it. And then all of a sudden, you know, you took a car that actually wasn't making money now because of the margins that was built into the accessories you were making. Yeah. Like, you know, I actually personally remember I had this one problem car and Jason, it was really ugly, like super, super, super ugly, right? Like it was a, it was a Mitsubishi Mirage, which just is an ugly car from the beginning, right? Like yeah. this one was like a, a super bright, like lime green one to top it off nice. and it was a manual transmission and it had no air conditioning right like i mean this is like everything working again and it was higher mileage too like everything working against us right but i remember some of the sales guys they started nicknaming the car yoshi you know from uh super mario brothers a little yeah yeah little green thing around yeah. character yeah. and i said you know what jokingly like i've heard it called yoshi so many times yoshi had been moved around the lot multiple times it was an aging thing. I said, you know what? Let's just embrace this. Someone go down to Walmart, find me some Yoshi stickers. Went online. We ordered some some Yoshi floor mats. We put little uh, hanging Yoshi in the thing. We, then we retook the entire thing. I spent one hundred and fifty two dollars and sixteen cents on Yoshi crap. <laughs> and then we repost. Then we redid the pictures. We called it Yoshi. I'm telling you, Jason, we sold it in a week after doing that. It was just, but it was little things, right? Well, yeah, I mean, you got you, here you are, you got a gamer who loves Nintendo, probably. Yeah, that would be the only person to probably accept that kind of car, especially if it's themed around their hobby, you know. Well, I think, I, look, I think for it, but we have to approach each vehicle uniquely, you know, and mm-hmm. but I think, that, I mean, obviously, we're talking about aging. And it's so funny. Every time we talk about aging, I'm like, okay, what's a good strategy for this? I'm like, how about we just don't let it age? Um, yeah. <laughs> like that sounds like a better one, right? It's like, <laughs> we're talking about reconditioning aging inventory for enhanced value, but like maybe we should have just reconditioned it well the very first time, and then we wouldn't have to be going back and aid and and doing that. But I, I find, you know, I, I don't know about you, but there's different dealerships have different strategies when it comes to the reconditioning expense. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I don't know. I mean, I've been talking to a lot of used car managers lately, and it seems like it's kind of up in the air. As far as like the strategies, I talked to one dealership the other day, had a flat, had a flat rate, no matter what the car was, no matter how many of them came in, it was just a flat reconditioning rate. Uh, sometimes, you know, the shop would make some, sometimes the shop would lose some. And then I have other dealerships that are more that traditional format where they like to sit there and argue back and forth on what actually needs to be reconditioned. I'm curious to see what you've been seeing with your own clients. 
Well, we try to get them a little bit more disciplined, not to judge every car the same. Because um, mm-hmm. then, especially as hard as it was getting cars in this market, um, you can't underbid reconditioning by 500 or overbid it. You know, you, you, you're list, missing deals. And then now as cars are depreciating faster, you could be buried in something. So you you, you kind of want to be more strategic with, you know, what that's going to cost. There's great tools out there. I know like AccuTrade and stuff that can pop a VIN scan in or pop a thing in and tell you if there's been any codes and what uh, what to anticipate on this year model and what could be uh, wrong with the uh, car. So in that the actual reconditioning on during the bid process is so important to be able to acquire the, the, the cars. I would say the right cars, but sometimes you can't control what trades in. It could be the wrong car. It's probably hopefully how you got that Mitsubishi. You didn't actually go buy that thing at the no, it gave it on trade. <laughs> yeah. on trade. So, <laughs> um, maybe you did want to miss that bid, uh, but no, it's, um, it's, it's real important. It's, and then the hard part is, is a lot of appra- people appraising cars might not have the knowledge of what it really costs to recondition. We, we'll track that a lot of times in our, in our system and it's, it's not as accurate. We're just tracking original cost to exit when the car exited costs. And if there's a $1,500 spread, we, 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 we stamp that difference. And obviously an older car, let's say a 15, 16, you know, mm-hmm. has a higher, let's say $1,500 reconditioning average on it versus the 2022 you're selling has an $800 reconditioning. So if I just did a flat thousand dollars i could be missing bids on the late models 2020s over over anticipating a reconditioning and then i again i could be overbidding a, a older model car uh or underbidding an older model car too when it's as far as reconditioning i'm you know putting a thousand when it's really going to cost me 1200 now I'm, I'm buried in that, that car a little bit more than i thought we even broke it down by segment you know large pickup trucks yes have more cost than a compact car so again if you're if you're bidding a compact car at reconditioning, like you're assuming it's a truck, you're missing some of these compact car deals because you overbid 500 and you could have gave 500 more on the trade and got the deal. So, you know, understanding that is more about some of this technology because, you know, I've, I've, I've seen people utilize and I love the, the trading technology out there. I love being able to capture this data and compare against real time. Uh, real-time data, but there's still an, an, an art to knowing what the vehicle needs or what the vehicle do- doesn't need. And, you know, I, I, I find too often they just kind of put just a price in there and they just assume, you know, that's that's what it's going to be. I mean, I can't tell you how, like, how many trucks did I take in knowing that, you know, based on their mileage or something, I was either going to have an upper control arm problem or I was going to have a strut problem on yeah. it. You know, just, just if, 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 if the truck was used for towing, you know, it's like if you don't know that, like there's not a system when you're taking pictures and scanning it that you know that the owner used it for towing. Therefore, you know you're going to be replacing at least an upper or lower control, you know, ball joints in the rear end of this thing if it's got a decent enough mileage to it. So it, I don't know. I just I love these systems. But then how do we be more accurate yeah. with that, you know? Yeah, you just got to have that knowledge and maybe work in that department for a little bit. But yeah, I mean... Um, I said, when I mentioned AccuTrade, from my understanding, it's like they know a certain year and certain mileage that this particular vehicle, 70% of the time has to have this replaced and it's a, you know, a $700 fix. So, um, yeah, I don't know, basically when you plug in a code reader, if it could code, you know, how much weight it's towed or not like that, but right. um, yeah, that's just communicating with the customer as you're appraising the car and figuring out, you know, what they, what they did with it and what they plan on doing on their next car. And you pick that information up. Look, I actually think it's – this is actually one uh, – no, look, I think for a lot of people out there watching and listening, you guys might think this is a boring subject or boring, uh, you know, topic for this. But I actually get excited about these particular topics inside our operations because I still find that there are places that require just – that experience, that knowledge, a uh, little bit of an art form to understanding, you know, what it is. And, you know, you're like, okay, so, you know, I know that this car is coming in and this Audi always replaces its belt at X amount of kilometer, you know, it's miles, whatever, right? So on. Yeah. But, you know, I, I like stuff like this. And this is why, so this good segue kind of into our next topic is like, now we're talking about like, okay, so reconditioning. I mean, I could probably go into a whole other podcast about reconditioning because as we were talking, I was just thinking to myself, like, how many dealerships are actually doing the full recondition versus the partial recondition? And how does that ultimately affect? Actually, I am going to go down that rabbit hole. You know me. I'll find rabbit holes. Yeah. I'd love to get your opinion on this because I've, cause I've seen like a, like a 50-50 split on this recently, right? Dealerships that go full recondition 
versus dealerships that go that partial reconditioning and hold off on some of the stuff, you know, until the vehicle gets sold. Do you feel like either one of those strategies either act positively or negatively to the fact that they could be aging? Uh, yeah, you know, here, here's a strategy I know some dealers used, and I thought it was pretty ingenious, and it's nothing new. But, um, you know, I'd be selective on it. Obviously, mm -hmm. you got a, you know, 2020 Escalade with, you know, 40,000. It's going to be a high dollar car that, you know, you want to make sure it's right. But you start looking at a 13, whatever, let's call it a um, Mitsubishi Galant, you know, and, and it has 80,000 on it. So it's nice enough that you don't want to wholesale it, but it's going to take three grand to repair it, which just might not be worth it. You know, some of the dealers that I've seen uh, do is, actually put it through the shop, get the RO, the repair suggestions and fix the ones that make it road legal and leave the other ones hanging, price the car accordingly. And then when the customer comes in, let them know, Hey, the car's, you know, street legal. It's everything's fine. Pass emissions, whatever your state requires. And then say, but when we also did the reconditioning, we found that this issue, this issue, and this issue, it's nothing that's a concern right now. Uh, but if you'd like for us to repair it, here's what it costs you my shop. We can go ahead and get it done. So they actually just, you know, itemize those repairs out to make it available to sell it cheap. But the customer's like, no, nah, it's fine. My brother-in-law runs a shop. I'll get, I'll have him help me and I'll do it myself or I'll have him do it or whatever the case is. So that customer might have been fine with buying it because it's, you know, here it is at a 12 grand car, but to repair it, you'd have to charge 15 and you know, that's going to be hard to find somebody to buy it for 15. So yeah. you put it out there for 12 or 13 and let them know here's two grand worth of stuff, but the, the car's road legal. So I think that's a, a smart move on those borderline stuff to be able to allow yeah. you to have, and people are doing that because they're shorthanded on cars um, and or staff on top of it too. Um, you know, I made that suggestion to dealers just really struggling with having enough staff for turnaround time. It's like, well, hey, why don't you get yeah. these cars called legal? Because he wouldn't market the cars and couldn't have them available for sales, slowing down his fresh sale rates. Like, get the car legal to be able to be drivable and viable, and then just itemize this stuff out. And when you can get it back in, and if somebody's interested in it now and wants to buy it, and they want the work done, then expedite at that point in time. Or if they're willing to buy it without even getting the work done, go ahead and sell it. And then now you've just been able to turn that inventory faster. So, um, hard part is, is this again, all that I know how people are, if you sell a car as is customers really, you know, you could <laughs> explain it as many times as you can, and they still going to come back and fight you or give you a bad review if something happened. But, um, so documentation, documentation with that kind of stuff. But, um, I think being selective and then taking opportunities, even if it's uh, even if it's not the car, but your internal processes because you're short staff, um, yes. you know, that's another option there for you. Well, look, that, that, that's being proactive. And, you know, uh, uh, guys that you're out there watching, listening, like they, that, that is the whole purpose of this Upbus podcast, right? Is, you know, if you're sitting around waiting for the Upbus, what you're doing is you're being reactive, you yeah. know, so and you're transparent. You're, 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 and exactly. you're being trans and being transparent. Customers like that. You're exactly. Being, hey, these exactly. are the things it's wrong. Being proactive. It's being transparent. Like yeah. you're, it's creating a better experience, you know. And uh, which is actually kind of okay. So this is a perfect segue kind of to the next topic. Is okay. So now we got this covered. Now talk about targeted marketing campaigns, right? I mean, look, I know that you review a lot of marketing data. I review a lot of marketing data, and I'm still. I, well, I don't know if I'm actually surprised. It's it's usually I'm not surprised when I go on to find out and I see the list of the aging inventory, then reflect that back to the marketing data and realize that most of this aging inventory would never even get marketed in the first place or was either marketed inaccurately. Yeah. Um, you know, I was like, oh, wonder why I got aged. But I, I'd love to kind of get your kind of thoughts on, you know, trying to get stuff from stagnant to spotlight and, you know, what kind of marketing campaigns can we do to not get the inventory date um let's start with flat pricing i'm um, looking at my other screen yeah. i was also on a call this morning a dealer had a 18 2018 alfa romeo and i'm going to pronounce the rest wrong stilibo and then a quadra quadra <laughs> i don't know it was an suv so this is in the where we're actually gonna, we're just going to put the name of the vehicle right underneath yeah, anyways <laughs> um you know, he had that uh, price at 42, which was too high. Matter of fact, we think we needed to be closer to 40. And I told him, I said, you have to be at 40 grand on this car. Uh, 42, uh, 42, five was 103%, you know, 40, even probably put him at 98, 99%. And it was, you know, 
48 days old should have been at 98 percent by then anyways yeah. so my point being is flat pricing um why I wanted the 40 grand even, not 39,995, not 40,172, 40,000 even, because I want to capture that. No one's looking. My point with Alpha Mare, no one's going to Auto Trader, I need an Alpha Mare more than likely. They don't even know this car exists. I can't even pronounce it. So, um, but it's a nice, it's a slick SUV. Matter of fact, my wife and I were looking for a used luxury SUV between a used one, 35 to 50 grand. And we ran across a couple of these. So after we ran across it, we, proactively start looking for that make a model but mm -hmm. more the only way we found it is like what's out there for 40 grand boom here it is yep. and if you're at 40,001 72 you're missing that shopper so flat pricing gets you gets you bumped in that uh 20 grand 19 grand or you know flat 50,000 25 30,000 40 grand that helps that with that marketing and then uh, comments and descriptions, obviously, meta, you know how to meta tag a website, right? That means mm -hmm. uh, if I'm in Olathe, Kansas here, Lenexus is down the street. Lenexa would be in my website. Uh, if uh, Overland Park is down the street, I'll locate the city of Overland Park's in there, too. So that way, if somebody's in Overland Park, and my website will pop up, even though I'm in Olathe. So you need to do the same thing with your comments. If you got a sunroof, um, don't just put sunroof, put sunroof slash moonroof because somebody might be searching for a moonroof and you put sunroof, you're out. Panoramic roof, put that in the description, but somewhere in the description, put sunroof or moonroof because it's technically the same thing, right? So um, customer might not know it's called a panoramic roof. They just want a roof. So things like that that you can do to help expose these cars better um, to make sure you get, get that exposure. And here's the other trick that we're learning, too, is some of these dealers and Steve Everhart, one of my reps, was showing me this. He was seeing as one of his dealers where they're using a lot of these AI chat GPTs to create whatever. Uh, we'll great them. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. You could just say, give me a, a review or a description of a 2018 F-150 XLT Larry or what? Larry, right? With the five, whatever two point whatever and so they dump it in and it spits out this great description and guys are copying and pasting and putting it in their comments and that's great but they got lazy with the rest of it what i mean by that is when you your inventory syndication tool whatever tool it is pushing it out to auto trader cars.com and so forth they're not necessarily on their left rail when they when people say hey i want a sunroof or i want nav or i want whatever equipment it's not really looking at the description so much. They're looking at the boxes that you checked. It has the 302A, which means it has leather seats, heated seats, and a sunroof. And it's checking. It's looking for those boxes to be checked. So even though that was all in the description, he was showing these dealers, look, I searched for a sunroof on your website. It's not here. Well, it's in my comments. Well, I know, but somebody narrows the search down. It's not there. So that way. as dealers are starting to use this comment builder, that's kind of automatic through chat GPT, which is great. Um, make sure you go back and check those boxes and even the back end of car gurus, no matter how it's sent to them. If you don't go into the back end and check, they have like 10 or 12 boxes to check off features, sunroof, nav, whatever. Go back there and double down on those features so you can show up in this. And it becomes from a good deal to a great deal or from a fair deal to a good deal because you specified to car gurus that it did have that sunroof okay. so it's all things like that that is going to help i could do a whole podcast on the good price fair price da, 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 da. i man i don't know i don't know maybe we'll save that for another podcast i got some feelings about that like i'm just yeah, like, bad. i'm like it's already a race to the bottom let's just let somebody else define what that bottom is anyway yeah. i digress <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna get heated up rabbit here. hole another rabbit hole <laughs> Gonna get heated up here in a minute, but I'm so glad you brought up the point of the comments, you know, because like I, I think it's again, it's a lost art, you know. Uh, too often did I just see like the exact same comment for every car, just copy and paste it for every single one. That drives me bloody bonkers when I see that. Well, only, not only that, go into sometimes your own website will provide yeah. this information. If not, go to like cars.com or auto trader, wherever you're listing your inventory and try to isolate your inventory on those sites. Then what's cool from there, once you isolate your inventory, use their left rail and you could see, OK, if I check sunroof, two cars pop up and you're like, shit, I know I at least got 10 cars with sunroof. All right, fix that. Find those cars. Um, the other thing, the biggest one is interior, exterior color. 
And what I found mostly, and I will go to like, if I'm going into a demo, I can pull up somebody's, let's say inventory on car gurus and I'll see an in, in interior color and it'll say red or, you know, gray, tan, whatever, right. Uh, black and then other. And so there'll be 20 and other, which means they got 20 cars with no interior colors on them because all they did was it had black. Mm -hmm. It can work opposite on exterior colors too, because maybe there's a new color that came out that it's, we know it's black, but it doesn't decipher that way. Let's say for example, Onyx black, right? It's not a new, let's say that new color came out, it's Onyx black. Well, and you send it to auto traders, Onyx, Onyx, and they don't know Onyx is black. So it goes in as others. So there's things like that, but it's mostly on interior colors. And here's the problem with that. I think the lower funnel customers, are, mm -hmm. hey, I want gray with black interior, or I want white with tan interior. And then if you're not showing up because you didn't include your interior color, you're missing those lower funnel shoppers. And so again, it could be something going back to the basic or something simple as not including tan interior. Well, and and just, that happens a lot. I mean, I remember when, you know, me and my wife uh, bought our first minivan when the kids when the kids were born, right? And, um, you know, I, I told her, I'm like, here's a list of dealerships I work with, you know, go, mm -hmm. just, you know, let me know if you see something you like, right? And she's like, okay, well, I narrowed it down. I want a town and country. I was like, okay, that's that's, that's cool. Here's here's the here's the nine Chrysler dealerships I was consulting with at the time. You know, it's like yeah. she came back to me. She goes, well, I only found two with the sliding uh, the sliding doors, the power doors. What? No, you didn't. Like, yeah. Every single town and country has it. She goes, no, 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 no. I, I I went through I went through it. I did the search. It was to your point. Only two out of forty seven vehicles between those stores that that fit our parameter actually had that marked off as a feature and then and then not only to top it off those were also the only two that took a picture of that so she's like no 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 i checked all the other ones none of them have a picture of it these are the only two that show the button for it and i'm like hey, there you go guys right there <laughs> well that's what i did when i was like what was it when i was selling cars we learned to go over the crumble zones underneath the hood or the side intrusion beams on the door to protect the customer. If it was a site, you know, if it was, you got T-boned and it's like every car had that feature, but none of the salesmen pointed it out. So it sounded like your car was a better car than the other car they just looked at because they had crumble zones and side impact, you know, those type of things. So same with your descriptions. I mean, every car has a power wind or power slider, but if you don't show it to them, they're going to assume it don't have it. Or if you don't put it in right. your description. Right. You know, and, and it's, it's funny that we're talking about descriptions. I love the fact we're using chat GPT to actually do that because I, I, I think we for a long time we just got too lazy about it. Right. Um, but but, you know, what, the descriptions are super important. I mean, it's the story of the vehicle. I buy into the story before I buy into the product. Like, let me read the story. Here's the one thing I will say. Um, just highlight the vehicles that are being sold privately and read through those descriptions because they're awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it seems like people that sell their vehicles privately understand the concept of, of description much yeah. better than our industry does. Because they're like, hey, I bought this car two years ago for my daughter. She used it to travel back and forth between university. Uh, the first year I did this, this, and this on it. Uh, yeah. Before she took it out, I bought these, these, and these. And it has it got like, a new battery last week. <laughs> the, the whole thing is just like all written out there. Yeah, all the equipment that they bought can make sure you know. Oh, yeah, I paid up three grand to have this, this, and this, and you know. But I, I, anyways, I didn't. Well, yeah. that's the other thing. Well, here, real quick too, is aftermarket yep. stuff. Like I oh, drive yeah. a truck, and I've got the aftermarket wheels and tires and mud guards, and you know, and power lift the pedals. I'm looking out there, or I power lift the you know, steps, and yep. um, but it, if I traded this in, I guarantee you, they're not breaking down the brand of the. You know, hey, it, oh, it's not. got Mickey Thompson. Uh, tires on them that are 500 a piece. So, you know, a dually. So you're talking three grand worth of tire, you know, whatever, three to four grand worth of tires. It's got these wheels that are retail at this and the power steps retail at 2,500. You know, they don't, that's the other thing I've seen about lifted trucks. They just assume yeah. the pictures are taken over. It's like, hold on, you got Fox shocks here and those are how much? And what about these, you know, these Rhino wheels, how much are those a piece? And there's five, you know, okay. Yep. And those put that in the description. Like you said, private sellers would. 
Oh, and you know. not only that, they'll actually tell you how much they spent on it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I like I'm, I'm, I'm in market for a classic car, so I'm kind of shopping right now. I don't know. I, I'm like bouncing all over the place between Mustangs and classic trucks and just you know, a little bit of everything, right? But, you know, like I love reading through these descriptions. They're like, yep, uh, it's been my project car for the last five years. You know, I got $30,000 invested in it and I'm selling it for $22,000. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> But, but, but no, I mean, I know we'll get, we'll get off this guys. We beat this, we beat this drum really hard, but again, this is just about being proactive. It's the little things. All right. That make up big deals that ultimately affect if the vehicle actually will age out or not. And that now I think goes into the more, the strategic approach now of maximizing uh, profit for aging inventory. You know, I, we've talked about this a couple of times, right? That zero to 30 days or that zero to 27 days, you know, do you go 103%, you know, on, or, or do you keep it 97 and rotate through? Like, you know, like aging inventory happens because we allow it to happen. It doesn't happen on its own. It happens because we allowed it to happen. You know, so I'd like to pick your brain, man, on some of the kind of different right. approaches or different strategies. Yeah, I mean, an age car, the decision was made at day 10 that made it age, not day 60. You know, mm, interesting. Maybe, you know, decision was day one when you, yeah, but yeah, it's usually happened at, you know, day 10, day 14, where you didn't make the right decision at that point in time. And then they tend to make the decision when it's aged because it's acceptable to take a beating at, you know, mm-hmm. on an age car. You just didn't want to take that. It's usually not looked upon as a good thing to take a short deal on a fresh car, but it's okay to take a shorter or loser on an age car. That's, typically how the industry works. So once we start calculating out things like holding cost, you know, and it, I just, it, I think it's, it's, it's what the efforts we need to put into that first, well, to your point. So I like this. So 10 days, so, okay, we're, look, the goal is 30 or 27, whatever you want to call it. Right. Uh, so <laughs> right at 10 days, all right, let's say I want to create a process. I, want to, I, want, I really want to process this, you know, like at 10 days, what kind of conversation do I have about that vehicle that's going to make me go left, right, up or down? Like, like what things should I be asking myself? Well, typically they're going to be like, well, the photos aren't done yet. So give me, an, you know, give me a little bit or the photos just got done. So give me a week or two to because it just got hit my lot. OK, well, in the meantime, for those 10 days, you didn't do a full description because you're waiting to see what everything was being done on it and what the car had. You don't have a full set of photos. You marked it up to give it a shot. I also ask them, you know, if we all agree the best time to make the most money on the car is day one or within the first 30 days, do we want to increase or decrease the odds of it selling in the first 30 days? So I want to increase. OK, well, pricing 104 percent with crappy descriptions and minimal photos. What are we doing? Are we increasing or decreasing it? Right. So all these things are talking about refreshing our age car to get it gone. We should be doing that with that fresh stuff, too. Um, and so if you're not doing those decisions and those tough decisions at day 10 going, all right, I know I just got it out. Uh, I know it just hit my lot, but I really just need to get this inventory moving because we're slowing down and I'm losing money. Now I'll put it at 98% instead of 103 just to give it a shot because you just got this. Now it's day 20 and you're finally going to 100%, but you're really not even doing that because here's what's happening right now. I just showed it to a dealer today. He had a car at 103. is maybe one of these. And uh, um, he changed the price a couple days ago after 20-something days. Mm-hmm. And it was a thousand dollar swing between his original price and where he is now. Uh-huh. It was a thousand dollar swing, but he went from one hundred three to one hundred three. Like when he put it out, it I think it was like forty three nine. It was one hundred and three. It went twenty something days. He dropped at a grand, and he's back at one hundred and three. So now he's at instead of twenty three nine forty two nine, but he's still at one hundred and three, which didn't work a month ago either so how fast what he needed going. to do to drop it 1500 to two grand to get it from 103 down to 100 but he's not going to do that so because he don't want to lose 2500 bucks so he already dropped it a grand he needed to drop another grand to 1500 he needed to drop it two grand so he just didn't react fast enough he's two to three weeks off pace on where he should be so instead of dropping it 2500 should only have to drop it maybe 500 because he's been moving it throughout that cycle but um because that's just how fast things are moving right now, right? So I want to go back because, like, I see this happen a lot. You know, uh, vehicle comes in, we take a minimal photos, three, four, five, maybe ten, whoever knows, right? Whatever minimal, we'll just whatever the word minimal is, right? Um, and then it goes through its whatever seven day, five day 
sometimes 10 day. I don't know whoever's got the better process, you know, of going through the shop for everyone it needs, getting it detailed, so on and so forth. But I am to your point, because I see this happen all the time. It's minimal photos, not very super clean as far as it is. And it's being priced at 103 because it's brand new. So we have this idea because it's brand new on my lot, it should immediately go there versus having, I think, kind of the strategy that you were talking about. It was like, no, no, no. You know, we, we go we, we go 102, 103 on vehicles that are hot, sexy and ready to go. You yeah. know, so like, would you and I'm just curious if you would recommend this, would you go for that 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 initial period, keep it at the 97, 98 after it's done its full detail and we have all these beautiful photos and better comments on it bump it up to the 102 103 would you would you recommend a strategy like that mm, not in today's market no okay. um and tell me why because i'm curious um well because the market's moving and, and things are moving slow the customers aren't just are just aren't there uh, again it depends on the car i guess we have taken an age car and raised it just to see if we can stir the pot somebody call and say hey that i saw it last week at this but um that's kind of a last ditch effort um you know when cars were appreciating yes when cars were flying off the shelves yes maybe um you, your reconditioning shouldn't reflect what the car sell for right yep. so a lot of guys well i can't price the car yet because the reconditioning aren't done yet no usually uh, pictures are the excuse also i don't know what i owe on it so yeah. to your point if i spent more now if i put some lifts and tires on it, i guess yes and I, maybe i missed that if that's what you did but mm -hmm. if you just did normal reconditioning and you just spent another 1500 to get it fixed um you know just to go back and raise your price 1500 and not describe it in your description hey we just put in a battery this this and this you know oh, you no say. you know what i'm saying and then because it always goes back and that's a, you know, shoot, we've said this for 20 years. It's like, you know, what you owe in the car is relevant to to what it's worth. We say that to customers all the time. Customer says, I want 19 grand. Well, we show them 15. You're like, where are you coming with 19? Well, that's what I owe. And what do we say to the customer? <laughs> if you owed a dollar, is your car worth a dollar? Yeah, exactly. No. So then in the meantime, and I tell this thing, you guys say this to customers all the time on the lot. But then when you turn around and look at your inventory, you're pricing at 103 because you own it at 109. And even though you're losing two grand, you just told me they don't sell at 103. You know, they sell at 97. So all we're doing is, you know, we're hypocrites. <laughs> we're, 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 we're telling the customer one thing and then we're doing the opposite. Or, you know, we're doing the same thing. But look, there's a lot of proactive dealers out there that aren't doing it that way. They, they, they are looking at the numbers. They are making decisions that are data driven. You know, and then that's the whole point of us guys just doing this podcast. It's just, look, it aging happens because we allow it to happen. And to your point, Jason, you said it, right? Aging happens in day 10. It's whatever decision you make at that point is what's going to determine if it's going to be an aging unit. Um, so, I mean, the, you know, when we, we've talked about everything from reconditioning. We've talked about marketing. We've talked about just how to maximize those profits. But at the end of the day, it just all comes down to just being proactive and not necessarily reactive to it and allowing that data to well, tell the truth. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let the car tell the truth or the customer, the market tell the truth too. <laughs> hey, Jason, I know we're at the tail end of our conversation. This has been a great conversation. Thanks for taking some time to come to the spa with me uh, so we can talk about rejuvenating, revitalizing our aged inventory. <laughs> Your feet are looking great. <laughs> you like my nails? You like my <laughs> pedicure, Medicare, Medicare. <laughs> Hey, for everyone out there watching and listening, we really appreciate your time. Um, please make sure to check out theupbus.com. All right. For more information and additional episodes. Everyone, you have yourself an amazing day. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Up Bus Podcast with your hosts, Jason Harris and Jason Rice. To stay up to date with all our content, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Happy podcasting.